So nice, good, even number for you to join us. So we really appreciate you being here. Yeah. Um, if you want to pop up your PowerPoint okay. there, go ahead and do that. You know, we had, you know, fissures are kind of this elusive critter we've talked about a little bit. And we've only potentially seen one, or is a debate if it was a pine marten or a fisher on a winter camping trip up in the Boundary Waters several years ago. I was sniffing my sleeping bag when I woke up in a startle. I saw it running away, so. But I'm excited to hear a little bit more and learn more about them. So I'll turn it over to you, yeah. Blaine. All right. There. Um, first off, just to do a check, uh, everybody can see and hear me, and, and you're seeing the screen, and it's it's full screen. Yeah, it looks good. It sounds All right. great. Good, good. Well, uh, thanks, Benji, and uh, for inviting me to talk about fishers, and uh, I look forward to uh, the next hour. And uh, what I will be doing, folks, is uh, going through a very simple PowerPoint uh, presentation about fishers with some pretty cool pictures. And uh, as I go through the PowerPoint, I'm going to read uh, a narrative, a story that I've written. I'm, a, I'm an outdoor writer, too. I write a, a weekly wildlife uh, column for several newspapers in northwest Minnesota. And, and fishers have been uh, a topic that I've frequently written about. And I just grabbed one of uh, one of my many stories that I've written about fishers and and uh, and adapted a PowerPoint presentation to it. So I'll just get started right here. Um, so to start, one November morning several years ago, while hunting deer from an elevated tree stand in Kitson County, I heard what I thought was the telltale sound of an approaching deer. Alerted to the noise. I turned myself toward the sound and waited. And I waited and I waited some more. About the time I had figured out that the sound I was listening to wasn't a deer, I at last discovered the source, a fisher. This dark brown animal, which was surprisingly surprisingly large, and, and no wonder it sounded like a deer, climbed an aspen tree about 25 yards from where I stood. Despite my standing as motionless as I could, the fisher seemed to have noticed me. Clutching the trunk of the tree with its long, sharp claws, the fisher peered at me for a moment and then climbed down the tree as quickly as it had just climbed up. In the next instant, the fisher disappeared. I was thrilled for having observed a rare albeit fleeting sight. And while Minnesota does indeed harbor plenty of fishers, few people ever see one. In fact, some people don't even realize that fishers are around at all. In fact, throughout my life uh, as an outdoor outdoorsman and experiencing all kinds of different adventures, um, I've only observed less than a dozen fishers my whole life. Fishers are members of the weasel family. Other relatives of the fisher include the pine marten, river otter, mink, badger, and of course weasels, short-tailed weasels, long-tailed weasels, least weasels, um, and the wolverine. The fisher is reputed as the fastest tree climbing mammal in the world, or I should say North America. These rather large and powerful animals with bear-like claws can literally run up and down trees as they hunt for prey such as squirrels and porcupines and, and other animals to, or to escape predators. The fisher has a curious name. I mean, most people looking at a fisher, you know, probably if they didn't know what this animal was and its natural history are probably thinking, would think that uh, these animals eat fish. There are only actually a few records in existence of a fisher observing eating or catching a fish. Their name is most likely the result of a nickname given by French fur trappers, fiché, which means pole cat. Undoubtedly an opportunistic creature that will take advantage of most any available food and prey, fishers were nonetheless named in reference to fishes and the name is stuck. That said, these highly intelligent and swift animals 
Hunters of the forest are better known at finding and killing forest dwelling terrestrial prey. Other names for the fisher include pecan, black cat or black fox, pole cat as already mentioned, and penance cat, evidently in reference to T. Pennant, the man who gave the fisher its Latin scientific name, Pecania penanti. But perhaps a more fitting name for the fisher was what the Ojibwe traditionally called this animal, Fa Cho, which means Big Martin. Undeniably, Martin-like in appearance and habits, the fisher is much larger than its smaller cousin, the pine martin. And they weigh up to 12 pounds, the, the males do, with a total length of over three feet from the tip of its nose to the tip of its tail. Fishers are indeed one of the larger members of the weasel family. Fishers and pine martens are arboreal weasels, that is, they are tree-loving weasel-like mammals, and both species are known to hunt similar prey, such as tree and ground squirrels, mice and voles, rabbits and hares, and birds. Elusive in every way, fishers are adept at avoiding detection. In part, this stems from its nature as a nocturnal hunter, to capture fleet of foot of prey like you know, rabbits and hares and squirrels and sometimes even young deer, fishers are deliberate and determined hunters and take advantage of their natural surroundings and abilities. What's more, the fisher is one of the only mammals known to actively kill porcupines for food. And here's an obvious picture of a fisher skull. Uh, you can see the carnassial um, molars there used to to tear and, and uh, cut cut uh, flesh very similar to uh, cats in that respect and the long canines for grasping prey that sagittal crest up on the skull is uh, where muscles are attached and so forth uh, so the, the 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 bite of a fisher is is pretty uh, pounds per square inch is, is pretty high Elusive in every way, fishers are adept at, uh, or I already said that, I'm sorry. Fishers accomplish this uh, with respect to porcupines, as already mentioned. Uh, this is one of the few mammals that actually can, can kill and, and, uh, and eat porcupines. Uh, one of the very few animals that actually actively seek out porcupines. Um, fishers accomplish this by being fast. Uh, but also by being extremely cunning. Porcupines, which are well armed, obviously, with a coat of quills that can inflict serious harm to would be predators, are creatures known for their defensive strategies, not their ability to outrun or outsmart their enemies. And so, you know, how do they do this? When confronted, a porcupine, if you've ever been around a porcupine, will often turn uh, its rear toward the aggressor. They'll puff out their quills and, and they'll rely on its protective armor or a well-placed slap to the, uh, you know, with its tail, a well-placed slap of its tail on, on the nose or the, the body of its attacker to repel it. But what the fisher will do to counter the porcupine's defenses is to repeatedly attack the facial portion of the porcupine until the animal is disoriented or uh, wounded badly enough to kill the porcupine quickly and safely without causing injury to itself. Another of the many, many amazing uh, attributes of a fisher is its physiology. Female fishers are, the, are only receptive to mating for a very short period of time in the spring after they give birth to their, to their litter. Once mating commences and successful fertilization occurs, female fishers begin an incredibly long gestation period uh, of 350 days, almost, almost a year. Long gestation periods are common in all members of the weasel family, 
this is time, so the fertilized egg attaches to the female fisher's uterine wall within uh, just months before the fisher kits are born in the springtime. This delayed implantation helps to ensure that young fishers are born uh, at the right time and have the best chance of survival. Of course, this is a fisher kit, cute little things. They're very bear-like in appearance. Ranging uh, mostly in forested lands, especially in mixed deciduous and coniferous forests throughout Minnesota's northern third, fishers are also found in other non uh, not so typical habitats. I've seen, for example, fishers uh, bounding along creek bottoms in the far northwest part of the state of Minnesota, like for example, Polk County, not too far from Warren, out in the prairie uh, near, near creeks. And they also occupy suitable habitats in, in the central part of the state and even further south in southeastern uh, uh, Minnesota. Trees and natural cavities, uh, or I should say trees with natural cavities and large hollow logs are critical components of their preferred habitat, especially for the females raising their young. Fishers will also use artificial nest boxes um, like uh, wood duck houses. And, uh, and plus they uh, will also utilize actual artificial boxes made especially for fishers. This one obviously is using one. Another encounter I had with the fisher several years ago occurred while I was uh, in a jack pine woodland in uh, in Wadena County. Uh, I was actually working at the time as a private lands biologist there, and I was uh, assessing the forest habitat for the landowner and writing a forest stewardship plan. But while hiking through the forest, I was startled when a large furry animal leapt from a thickly limbed nearby pine tree. The dark form hit the ground in a loud thud and then immediately ran as fast as it could in the opposite direction. It, it did startle me, I'll have to say. And it took uh, a moment for my mind to run through a checklist of the possible mammals that, 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 was, that, that it could have been but I quickly surmise that what I had just seen was, was indeed a fisher, although very fleeting glimpse of one. But I remember being very thrilled for having observed the rare sight. And then just last winter, uh, you know, Benji kind of mentioned something similar to it. I had an experience uh, every year I go up to the Boundary Waters with a group of friends um, and we do winter camping and lake trout fishing. And you know, we, we always leave our tent doors, our tent flies open uh, for whatever reason. We just leave them open during the day. And I had heard something uh, rustling over by my tent, and I knew that there wasn't anybody over there. Uh, we were all sitting around the fire and uh, <laughs> looked up, and lo and behold, a, a fisher had been in my tent. It had just left my tent, but it had in its mouth uh, a bag of my trail mix. So. Um, lesson learned, uh, keep the keep the pack closed and maybe the tent closed too. Um, this is just obviously a picture of, of a fisher track in the snow and it's pretty common in the woods up here in northern Minnesota where I live. I live just a few miles from Itasca State Park and LaSalle Lake State Recreation Area and I frequently will encounter tracks of fishers but uh, not the actual sight of one. And, you know, it's very bear-like in look, you know, it's spread out toes and you can see the, the claw marks in the snow actually of this animal. And uh, the one thing that fishers do and all mustelids mostly do uh, is they have this gate that's sort of a bounding gate. And, and here obviously is, is a fisher um, bounding through the snow. Fishers are distinctive and interesting animals. That's for sure, and few people really observe them in the wild, and they're trapped. There's a trapping season for fisher in, in Minnesota. It's a very short trapping uh, uh, season. As you can see here, it's uh, December 17th this year through the 25th uh, of December. It's a nine-day season. Limit is, is only two, um, and, but there are, there are a lot of people that uh, 
that uh, target fishers uh, during that season. And this is just a common uh, method that that uh, fisher uh, that trappers use to trap fisher. It's uh, called a cubby set, and inside of that box would probably be some bait toward the rear of that box, and in the front is uh, the trap itself, which is a body gripping trap that is designed to uh, to uh, kill um, fur bearers uh, quickly and humanely. Trap for their valuable fur during the state's closely regulated fur fisher, or I should say fisher trapping season, this large member of the weasel family continues to thrive while remaining virtually unseen. Like I said earlier, I've only seen a dozen or so in my lifetime just out in the woods. Once nearly extirpated from the state because of deforestation and unregulated trapping, this mysterious Minnesota mammal is abundant once again as we get out and enjoy the great outdoors. The secret of Fisher. Thank you. Well, thank you, Blaine. You're welcome. So we'll see if uh, well, I can ask you a couple of questions while John Amber, if you want to pass the power sharing ball to John and he can share his PowerPoint. Um, I was just Googling this, but Caitlin asked Blaine about, she believes they have fishers on her land south of Red Lake based on trail cam footage. Sure. She'd love to build some fisher houses. Any recommendations for instructions and tips oh, yeah. on how to yeah, do I, places to do it? Go. If I get a hold of uh, the email address and so forth, I could uh, easily send you some, uh, some uh, plans on how to build one of these boxes that... Uh, Oh, I, maybe John could help me here a little bit, but I had I had some correspondences with the University of, or no, it wasn't University of Minnesota, NRRI, I believe, um, uh, with regard to building these boxes and getting them out in the in the in the woods out there. So I yeah I can do that. I'm gonna put a link to that article in the uh, chat right now. So we'll let John pull up his PowerPoint and. And talk about that afterwards if we get more questions on it. So, yep. Can you see that now? Yeah, it looks good, John. Thanks. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Michael Joyce, a uh, uh, former graduate student who worked on our Fisher research project here, now is a research. Researcher with uh, the Natural Resources Research Institute out of uh, or in Duluth, and they are actually in the midst of a of a research project um, looking at fisher use of these den boxes. Uh, and so uh, we can uh, one way or another, Benji or somebody can help. But we can get some information on the design they've been using, and there's a couple other designs folks have used in other states or Canadian provinces. Um, Honestly, not that much different than a lot of typical wood duck boxes, just uh, maybe a little bit more uh, sturdy, a little bit larger. So anyway, I'm going to move on. Uh, my name is John Herb. As, as uh, Benji said, I'm a wildlife research biologist uh, working on, on fur bears in Minnesota in, out of the Grand Rapids office. Um, I'm going to just uh, add a few uh, bits of information from what Blaine presented, maybe expand on a couple things he talked about as well. Uh, my job is mostly focused on monitoring and research, so I'm um, going to have a little bit more uh, graphs and some data. Um, not not as polished a storyteller as as Blaine. Um, so uh, here we go. Um, Blaine mentioned some things about the uh, basic Fisher description, but adult males in the range of seven to twelve pounds, ones as big as twenty pounds, have been reported. I recall one in Wisconsin. Um, females, adult females are only four to six pounds. So they look a lot bigger than what they actually weigh. Um, you know, anywhere from two and a half to four feet long, including uh, the tails. Most of the time, they're the color you see in the bottom right, uh, kind of a black, but uh, uh, often uh, lighter colored buff brown, uh, even some silvery colors in the front half. They usually have some sorts of white patches in their underarms, groin, and chest area. You can't see in this photo, but most fishers will have a white patch or two on areas of their underside. 
And on occasion, there are either true albino fissures that turn up or, or at least light colored ones uh, like you see over in that left photo. Um, this is just to show you uh, some similar like animals in Minnesota that might be confused with a fissure. Um, the top left is the fissure, top right is an otter. Size wise, they are fairly similar. Otters usually weigh a lot more, but some of the biggest differences, as you can see, are the otter, otter fur is much shorter and sleeker looking. Um, the otter does not have uh, prominent ears that you can see more of a smooth tapered head, uh, whereas the fisher and the martin in the bottom right um, have more of that triangular fox-like uh, shape to their face uh, with a little more prominent ears. And uh, fisher tails are also more fluffy than that than that otter tail is. Uh, martin is the closest cousin to the fisher, and the martin's in the bottom right. Very similar in shape to the fisher, just much smaller. Uh, you know, half the size, uh, maybe less, depending upon the age and sex of the animal. And they often uh, more color variation from an orangish color to a to a dark chocolate brown. They have more color variation. Um, than do uh, fishers. Martin are most apt to be confused size-wise anyway with the mink, which you see in the bottom left, uh, maybe more familiar with. So a little bit uh, bigger than a mink maybe, um, but again, the, the, the head of a mink is a little more tapered, lower profile than is the Martin, um, and, uh, but otherwise somewhat similar. Um, little history, Blaine touched on this, but Prior to European settlement of Minnesota, um, fishers were found throughout most of the forested regions, and that did include southeast Minnesota, uh, places just, uh, down to the Minnesota River Valley, which uh, had more forest um, in, in years past. Um, only in, the, in some of the true prairie, tall grass prairie areas would fisher have been absent in Minnesota. Uh, and as Blaine also mentioned, due to unregulated harvest, and massive uh, loss of forest uh, from logging, fires, land clearing, and so on. Fishers were nearly gone in Minnesota by 1930. Um, and it was around that time that the state um, closed. Uh, uh, there was no harvest allowed on, on Fisher at all beginning in 1929. And that remained closed um, until 1977. Uh, during that time, especially from the 50s or late 50s and 60s up until around the late 70s, early 80s, the forest went through a period of recovery, uh, grew, grew back, aged, uh, and this made habitat much more suitable again to fishers, along with uh, the lack of harvest, uh, the populations recovered nicely. Um, population, nevertheless, has fluctuated even in modern times. Uh, I don't, I don't know if you can see my mouse moving around on the screen or not, but this graph only starts in 1977. If we could extend this back to say the turn of the century, obviously this line would continue going down to not far from zero. So you're only seeing a part of the increase uh, into the 70s, 80s through the late 90s. Um, however, fisher numbers, uh, you know, especially in most of the areas of the North where they are, are more uh, thought of as more common or the core areas, numbers have declined again uh, over the last uh, decade and a half to two decades. We believe this is because of, of another kind of cycle in forest age. Uh, in the late 1980s, uh, there was a lot of increased uh, interest in forest products and increase in logging uh, that began and over a period of time that reduced the forest age structure and uh, we believe contributed to some of the decline of fissures. Still far more than, you know, uh, still still abundant compared to the 1930s, uh, you know, around 8,000 fishers now in the state, uh, but nevertheless kind of a cycle in modern times. Um, this is just a map showing fishers association with forest uh, throughout North America. This map just shows forest cover in uh, in North America. It's, it's of course imperfect, but kind of gives you the picture and here you can see the typical range of fishers throughout North America certainly has expanded some in modern times to include further areas further south in Minnesota, 
Certainly they're now well down the Appalachian areas. There's been reintroductions in places like Tennessee. They're doing well in Pennsylvania, West Virginia. Uh, so they, they've recolonized some of those areas down the Appalachians, as well as uh, some areas further south in the upper Great Lakes area. Um, and as Blaine, I think also touched on, there's actually fissures uh, low, but, but you know, stable numbers in many drainages, even in Eastern North Dakota. Uh, as the Minnesota population expanded. To talk a little more about the expansion we've seen. I, I mentioned that fisher populations have actually declined some in the areas in the north uh, in, in modern times. At the same time, fisher populations have actually still been expanding south and westward in Minnesota. So this just shows kind of a, a summation of harvest locations of fishers grouped by about five year intervals. I, there's a gap here, but you can kind of see this picture where uh, generally fishers were found north of this line, uh, even though harvest was allowed uh, down to this line you can see here. This is the early 2000s. Jump out five years from there, uh, you can see some pretty big expansion of fisher numbers, especially in west central Minnesota, um, Otter Tail County, places like that. And continuing forward, jumping a little further forward in time, you can now see the last five years, uh, lots of fishers in this area uh, in the south uh, or in the central part of the state, extending down into the metro. Uh, this just shows harvest locations, uh, and harvest again is only allowed down to that uh, I-94 corridor. Separate from that, this bottom right graph shows we've been keeping track of of just sort of opportunistic fisher confirmations in the southern part of the state. And this shows, you know, over the last 10, 15 years where we have confirmed Fisher. So we've, we've certainly been seeing expansions of Fishers into uh, Southeast Minnesota. Uh, certainly in areas, there's probably should be a lot more dots in this area of, of central, uh, South Central Minnesota, um, and all the way down to the upper parts of the uh, Minnesota River Valley. So we're seeing some very nice uh, expansion there. I would say fisher reports from southeast Minnesota are now fairly common. Um, and there's, as a result of that, there's a new study <coughs> beginning, excuse me, looking at uh, fisher uh, presence, abundance, a little bit about habitats, trying to radio collar a few to learn more about habitat use. And this is being done in the metro area and, and down in south parts of southeast Minnesota. So hopefully we're going to learn a little bit more about the behaviors and habits habitat use of fishers where they've expanded into these new areas. Um, won't say a lot here, Blaine had a nice photo of a track. Uh, he was talking about the typical bounding of fishers in snow and that usually results in the track pattern you see in the top left, this two by two pattern. Um, usually seen when there's a little bit deeper snow or fluffier snow. When you get snow that is a little crustier, harder or less, and especially if the fisher is, is doing more of a slow walk, you often see these patterns that are three groups of three or four together, as you see in the two bottom photos. Um, and uh, one thing about fishers that distinguishes their track from some other animals is they have five toes. You don't always see the fifth toe real well, depends on the substrate they're stepping in. But things like foxes, coyotes, bobcats, dogs, cats have four toes. Um, the only other animals that, you know, in Minnesota that have five toes that you might confuse with here would be like a raccoon, uh, but their toes uh, are generally longer uh, than you see in these fisher photos. Uh, so just, just some examples of tracks you might see in the snow. Blaine touched on their diverse feeding habits. Um, they really are one of the most diverse eaters we probably have in Minnesota, capable of, of taking prey that's in trees, on the ground. Uh, we believe that they probably spend most of their time hunting on the ground, not in the trees, even though they're very adept at that. Uh, species like mice and voles, squirrels, rabbits, hares. Uh, skunks are uh, often taken by fishers. Um, I'll talk about a study we did of fishers here in a minute, but one of the things that I, uh, I often see is, or noticed is a high percent of fishers have a little bit of a skunky odor to them. So I think skunks are probably uh, commonly taken by fishers. Um, 
And uh, the, uh, in, in summertime, their diet is even more diverse. Uh, numerous studies have documented them eating berries and even mushrooms. Um, but, to, well, excuse me, one, one more little tidbit from a, an older study, just to show how the diet can vary uh, with prey abundance. This was over a eight year period, I think, looking at Fisher diet from stomach contents in Northern Minnesota. And if you don't know, uh, snowshoe hares go through these 10 year cycles, just like grouse uh, and other, some other Northern species do. And what they found is that when the snowshoe hares were at the cyclic peaks, uh, they constituted about a third of the Fisher diet. But when the hare numbers declined, they only constituted about 3% of the Fisher diet. Uh, and they turn to uh, eating um, more small mammals, squirrels and rodents and stuff. And although porcupines, uh, fishers are well known as, as porcupine predators, uh, not a lot of studies show that they constitute a very large portion of their overall diet, but they certainly, when they do take one, provide a, a large protein source. Um, this is an interesting set of photos. Uh, this and the next one are kind of designed to show you the diversity of their hunting skills and, and prey. Uh, I don't, there's no study that's shown that uh, fishers preying on deer fawns is common at all. And the same true with the next slide I'll show. But nevertheless, it shows their capabilities. This is a sequence of photos, I believe from Wisconsin of a fisher chasing a deer fawn into the water. Top right showing the fisher swimming over to get the fawn as it's trying to get out. And the bottom two showing it uh, 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 killing the, the fawn. So may not be common, but shows their versatility and capabilities. This one, I'm gonna try and play it, um, is, is a, uh, a video. There was a webcam being uh, taken of a hawk nest way up at the top of a tree. Uh, had two, two young hawk nestlings uh, in it. And uh, I'm gonna see if this will play. The beginning, it, it doesn't do anything. It takes a second, it's, but it'll just briefly show you uh, again the, uh, from top of trees to into the water or on the ground, fishers uh, are, are pretty, uh, pretty flexible, capable carnivores. So this is just the two nestlings in this, in this nest. And if you just watch, you'll uh, see a little tree starting to shake a little bit, a um, little movement and uh, up comes the fisher. Um, this was actually down near uh, Little Falls, the Camp Ripley area, central part of the state. So um, fishers also interact with other carnivores in the state. Their close cousin, the Martin, is one. We certainly have lots of areas of the state where these species coexist just fine, but nevertheless, they do interact with each other. This is a sequence of photos where somebody, I believe a trapper had placed some beaver carcasses out uh, for, for the other critters in the woods to consume and had a trail camera placed at it. And you can see in the top left, at least I think you can see a, a Martin in feeding on a beaver carcass. The top right shows the Martin now standing up, um, looking on alert like something's going on. Bottom left is now showing the Martin turning it and hightailing it away. And the bottom right shows a fisher that came charging in and actually did uh, catch and kill the Martin. So may not be common. Uh, this isn't, you know, somewhat of an unnatural situation here with this bait pile, but we we uh, know from research studies that fishers uh, do oftentimes uh, kill martins and, and so interact with other predators as well. I'm going to switch gears and expand a little bit more uh, from what Blaine had on reproduction. He touched on this delayed implantation process with fishers and other mustelids basically means that most adult fishers are, are, uh, are, are pregnant uh, the entire year, their entire life. Uh, it's just that the, the uh, uh, embryos are only developing for a couple months during that year. So within a week or to 10 days after a fisher gives birth, it breeds uh, and becomes pregnant again. Uh, and it's just not until the following uh, uh, late winter when the embryos begin to develop. When the young are born, uh, they're very helpless, dependent upon mother, eyes closed, near hairless. Um, so not very independent uh, until they're about four months of age when they're weaned. 
Uh, and usually by a year, they do leave. They don't uh, stay in family groups. Uh, the young disperse uh, usually by one year of age. And the males do not uh, help uh, raise the young. From this research project we did where we radio collared about 120 fishers uh, in three areas of the state. This was um, an area up in northeast Minnesota near Hoyt Lakes and Babbitt. Uh, one area uh, near the north central Minnesota near Grand Rapids and another one in central Minnesota near Camp Ripley. So we radio collared a total of 125 fishers and, and, and did a lot of research on them. Uh, we confirmed that in, uh, in, in more of the central part of their range, they're probably giving birth in early to mid-March. Uh, and further north, it's probably mid-March to early April. Um, the uh, adults, once they reach three years of age, um, most of them are producing kits. So a three-year-old fisher actually became pregnant at two, didn't give birth till about three. And in those situations, again, about 95% of fishers are producing a litter. Whereas the ones that are two-year-olds, only about uh, two-thirds of them uh, are producing litters. So they become pregnant at year uh, one year of age and uh, and give birth at two. So not highly, uh, not high reproductive output by fishers. They are a species that we have to have more uh, management caution with. Uh, they're not as uh, reproductively productive as you know things like muskrats and raccoons and rabbits and so on. Um, of the 47 litters we were able to examine uh, with video equipment in tree cavities, um, uh, around two and a half kits is the average. So a little more for those older females to 2.7 kits on average, a little bit less, a little over two uh, for those two year olds. One of the things we did find on our study, however, is that there was a complete loss of those litters uh, by 30% of those females we collared. And this was because the adult females were being killed um, uh, during that spring period when they were trying to raise young. They were killed by other predators. And I'll give you more detail on that uh, a few slides later. Um, this is just a quick video showing uh, some work that our, our uh, video folks did of us uh, showing you how we get some of this information from these dens. Um, these dens are usually in tree cavities, but we have a long telescoping poles when we track these radio collared females to the dens. Uh, we would uh, uh, use this long pole with a little video probe on the end of it to insert in there and lower it down in. And it allowed us to confirm that there was a litter um, and uh, to get a count of how many kits were present. So a little jumpy and blurry for a second, but it'll settle down here in a minute. And so we would just let the video um, play for a while. The kits oftentimes would move and crawl under each other and climb on top. And we were able to get a good count of how many were there. Um, so it just gives you, it was a fun part of this project, uh, uh, getting this type of information. Uh, gave us a lot of good data on pregnancy rates, litter sizes, and the types of areas that they were giving, giving birth in. Um, we did find independent, uh, we think, of, of any uh, disturbance that we sometimes create by going there, that females often move kits multiple times during the, the period when the kits are growing. So it's probably because uh, uh, dens might become dirty. Other predators may figure out that there's a den nearby. Um, you know, females need to move to an area where there's a little more prey because they're been consuming mice and rabbits near their den tree, and so there may be less over time and they have to move. Uh, and it also shows nicely them how they carry the kits and move them from place to place, and also shows their ability to climb down trees head first. Their, uh, their hind legs, uh, the joints in their rear feet are able to turn almost 180 degrees as they come down trees. So very skilled climbers. Um, on this study we did, um, Almost all uh, of the birthing dens were in tree cavities. Um, and of those tree cavities, most of the cavities were actually in live trees, not in older, um, more decayed snags. Most of, the, of those cavities were also in aspen trees. Um, however, some more detailed research we did, we concluded it wasn't because they really preferred aspen, 
it was simply that cavities were most common in aspen trees in the areas we did the study. So it wasn't there was necessarily something better about an aspen cavity, just that they were more common. Second most common were cavities in oak trees. And uh, I think if we were to expand this study into more into central Minnesota and certainly southeast Minnesota, I think what we would find is that some of these species on this list, especially oaks, maybe some uh, uh, silver maple, cottonwood, maybe even elm, some other species like that would be uh, very commonly used uh, since aspen is not very uh, prevalent uh, as you move further south. Uh, so these other tree species would increase importance uh, moving to those other areas. Um, once the kits get real big, I'm sorry, did somebody say something? Oh, I think you're good, Jen. Oh, okay, um, just a few more slides here. Uh, once the kids get bigger, kids get bigger. It's uh, the, they can't uh, still uh, be in those small tree cavity dens, so they more independent. They look for some of these other sites, whether it's a brush pile, a hollow, fallen log, other sites to move the kids to uh, as they're older. Um, one of the things we also found in this study is that. Fishers preferred areas where they're, um, or they preferred these live trees. I think I already mentioned that actually, but they preferred these live trees uh, with cavities over these decaying trees. They also preferred stands of trees, uh, patches of woods that were older. You could have a good tree with nice cavities, but if it was surrounded by, um, you know, young forest or openings, it was not as preferred as was a cavity tree that was in a patch of a lot of older trees that maybe had numerous options uh, for having cavities where you could move the kits to. Um, one last tidbit on reproduction we found real interesting. I mentioned before that fishers, females, that though they breed approximately seven to 10 days after they give birth. And sure enough, what we found, we had trail cameras placed at all the females' den trees and right about seven to 10 days after those kits were born, male fishers seem to show up at the trees and patiently wait for the female to leave uh, so they could mate. Um, we think these male fishers cue in on looking for these big trees. Um, they kind of abandon their home ranges in the spring and start wandering, looking for females. The females also scent mark at the bottom of the trees. You can see these two males in the middle two pictures, um, you know, diligently checking out the scent on the ground nearby. So uh, very, very, uh, very good and successful at finding these dentries come springtime. Switching the gears to the last few slides, just on survival, I mentioned uh, a little bit about that before, but of the fishers we collared, we had 57 die where we were able to determine whether it was human caused or natural. Uh, about two thirds of them were natural causes and about one third were human related. Uh, interestingly, you know, female fishers were about 57% of the animals we collared, but they constituted about 73% of the natural deaths, but only 44% of the human cause. So females appear to be more vulnerable to, to death through natural cause, males a little bit more vulnerable to death through human related causes. Um, what were those? So this is a little complicated, but this just shows the natural cause deaths. There were 37 of those. Um, of those 37, 79% died because of another predator killing them. And we did have a few, we just couldn't determine cause of death. But of the ones that were killed by predators, um, almost all were females. You can see 24 out of the 30 were female fishers. And nearly all of those were adult females that had kits in the spring. Um, raptors uh, also killed uh, five fishers, um, mostly males. Most of the predation was by other mammals. However, 22 of the total predation deaths were other mammals killing the fisher and only five were, were birds, raptors. Um, most of the time, the fishers that were killed were not consumed, but some were. It may be more of a competition type of killing. Um, I mentioned that female uh, females were more killed by other predators. The only males killed by predators were, were there were uh, four uh, killed by uh, bald eagles. 
We think these were around carcasses where both Fisher and an eagle were scavenging. Uh, they never killed the Fisher outright. The Fisher was able to run off, uh, but had talon wounds through its uh, into its lungs and so on. Um, female deaths were mostly bobcats, were the other predator that was killing them. I'm going to skip that because I think I need to move on um, and uh, give time for questions. Uh, human related causes again, only a third of the deaths. Um, about half of those were legal trapping, half were accidental trapping. Sometimes fishers are taken out of season in a trap that's set for another species. And we did have a few car kills, but not many. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much for that, John. I'm going to remember to turn myself off mute there. If you want to stop your slideshow, we got quite a few questions going on here and a lot of comments. You know, Brad said they've, they have a fisher between Rochester and Owatonna. You were talking a little bit about them moving down that area. So, and Martha commented up by Garrison, they have a fisher in a hollow oak tree behind their house. They had some some kits with it, so that's kind of cool. Thank you for commenting on that. Uh, Steve was kind of wondering, how does the DNR count the fisher population in Minnesota? How do you estimate that? Yeah, that's that's a good question. It's actually not one that we're, uh, well, we're working on some new methods, but to date, most of those numbers I showed you were based on uh, population modeling, which means the best analogy I always have for people is it's kind of like balancing your checkbook. If you have good information on deposits and withdrawals, you, you, you know what your balance is. And so what we, in this case, what uh, deposits means is reproduction. So you saw the study I presented where we gained some information on pregnancy rates, litter sizes, and so on. That helps us model, you know, the, the number of new, new young born every year. Um, then the study also provided us that mortality data. How many fishers live throughout the year? So that's kind of the withdrawal. How many, how many die, I should say. So when you have the survival rates and the reproductive rates, those two pieces of information are what we use to kind of um, model the population through time. It all starts with kind of a guess as to back when we started doing this. How, how many fishers do we think were there in 1977 when we started, uh, you know, this modeling? Uh, and that's based just on observations, on known home range size of fishers. How many can you fit in here? It's a little bit subjective, but it kind of provided a starting point. And then it's just a matter of projecting through time, known, known withdrawals or deaths and known deposits or births. Um, we are working on some other methods that are more based on, you can estimate population size just by uh, knowing the ages of the animals taken in the harvest. Um, and and how much effort hunters, or in this case trappers, are putting in? It's it's very complicated, but uh, but it's but it seems to be a pretty reliable and sophisticated approach to estimating populations. Um, and so we've been working on that method here the last five years or so. That's great. You mentioned a couple things in there about the home range, and Caitlin is also wondering how old they live in the wild. If you have an estimated lifespan. And somebody else asked about their home range. How big is their home range typically? Yeah, um, we've we've documented in, in Minnesota. Um, we've documented fishers living up to 13 years of age. Um, certainly, that's rare. You know, most fishers probably are not making it past uh, you know five, six, seven years of age. Um, but we do have them up to 13 years of age. Um, the other question, oh, home ranges. Um, oh, that's one I should uh, have right off the top of my head, but for some reason, just uh, uh, give me a quick second and I can uh, tell you, we, we did uh, some work with that um, on, uh, on this study because we tracked these females every seven to 10 days to get locations and that allowed us to map home ranges. Um, and it was it was basically, Oh, I got to convert these. I, uh, let's see, these are in square kilometers. Um, female fishers, I want to say like, you know, uh, three to five square miles and males um, over double that. 
uh, maybe even triple that in some cases. Um, I've got them. Pretty, them good, pretty good size home range then. Yes, they for the size of their body, Fishers and Martins have abnormally large uh, home range sizes um, compared to you know a lot of other mammals that fall on a more typical line of bigger home ranges with bigger bodies and. But uh, for their size, both of these species have quite large home ranges. A Fisher home range, for example, would be much larger than a raccoon home range, and a raccoon is similar or bigger uh, in size than a Fisher. Yeah. Um, Maverick was wondering if is there any reports of Fishers ever attacking like hunting dogs? No, I have not. Uh, Blaine can add his thoughts, but I have not heard that. We certainly. Uh, and, and I actually hear this more in the parts of the northeastern United States, more reports of fishers may be attacking somebody's farm cat or house cat um, that's uh, on the porch, things like that. But I can't say as I've ever heard a fisher attacking anybody's dog, whether hunting dog or porch home, you know, porch on the porch or wherever. Yeah, I haven't either, John. Um, you know, that what you just mentioned about cats, you know, with one of the one of the things that uh that I don't particularly care to see are are domestic cats running wild, um, so to speak, and uh, it, it's very likely that those domestic cats, feral cats, uh, you know, fall prey to fishers from time to time, and certainly they do from time to time fall prey to coyotes and so forth, and and there are some records of of uh, uh, a trapper. For example, trying to release a fisher from a leg hold trap that that uh, might, on occasion, um, have to tussle with a fisher. And you know, maybe John, you've had some experiences uh, with research. I don't know, but uh, I can see where at times it could be that a fisher could turn on a human in a situation like that. Yeah, like I said, I don't think I've ever heard of it reported of a fisher attacking a human unless it was an odd case where one had rabies or something. I mean, even otters have been known to do that if they right. have, are defending a den site or have rabies or something. But generally, I think it's only if you, you know, have a lot, if you live in fisher country and you have outside cats, they would be more vulnerable. I generally don't think dogs or people have much to worry about with fishers. But, you know, anything is possible. I've been bitten by a lot smaller animals, even, you know. <laughs> and one of the other, Blaine, you were talking about a story where the fisher came in and stole your trail mix out of your tent. <laughs> yes, it did. <laughs> uh, some, somebody asked in the chat about them going after bird feeders. I'm assuming after, if they like nuts out of your tent, they'll probably go after the nuts in a bird feeder too. If they're hungry, huh? Well, you know, I maybe I misunderstood the question. I answered it, but I, I thought the... <laughs> The the the, the uh, question was more you know, going after the, the the animals that are attracted to bird feeders, like like birds, obviously, and oh. uh, rodents, like you know mice and voles and shrews that are attracted to those sites too. I mean, for sure, in those situations, uh, fishers and martins and weasels are all attracted to bird feeding stations for that reason, and on occasion. Uh, you know, the, the fisher itself is an omnivore. Uh, it isn't all, uh, it's not all about meat. So, you know, there there could be some morsels within some of those bird seed mixes, uh, fruits and so forth, um, that, that could be attractive to some, some, uh, some, some fishers, I suppose. Okay. Now we're running a little close on time here, but um, Mary put in the chat also, she's observed a very dark, brown animal bouncing over the trail around an urban pond. Um, there's some muskrats out there chasing ducks around and they're wondering if you have any idea what that might be. It's in the, you know, uh, could be a mink or fisher, she said, uh, they're in the Stillwater area. So I don't know. It could be an otter, river river otter here. too. Um, yeah. You know, it, it's hard to say for sure. Uh, you know, fishers, otters, mink, Weasels are all attracted to wetland areas uh, where, where frequently enough, uh, hunting is good and prey are abundant. So, you know, maybe all of the above. Um, uh, not sure. Oh, yeah, yeah I, would, I would guess if it, you know, rarely, although they do vary, rarely does a good view of a fisher 
give you the appearance that it's that it's clearly brown. You know, you usually get a sense of more black, where it may be lighter brown. You know, have some brown silver on the head, but usually your your gut reaction is that was like a blackish colored animal. If you're certain it was a dark, you know, chocolatey brown or something like that, you know, mink and otter would be the two if it's around a wetland that seem most likely. But as Blaine said, no way to say for sure. I know we covered this a little bit probably in your presentation, but Keith said he's been out hunting around St. Joe for about four years and he's been seeing fishers just about every year. How long have they, you talked a little bit how they've been migrating south a little bit. So um, do you have any estimate and how long they've been in that area? St. Joe, St. Cloud area? Yeah, you know, in that in that area, St. Cloud area, I, I would say it's probably been the better part of 15 years that there's probably been, you know, individuals showing up in some of those areas. We It does appear we've seen, and this is maybe more true in the southeast part of the state, it, it seems like the last five to seven years we've seen a notable jump in reports. Some of it could be awareness of people reporting them to us. But I do think maybe they're, they've hit sort of a critical mass where some, it's always hard to increase when there's only one or two of you. But once you start climbing, getting a few, you know, sometimes then it can take off pretty good. And so down there, it's been more the last five to seven years where it seems to be taking off. St. Cloud area, I, I'm guessing they've been around and, and uh, there for, for the better part of at least 10, if not 15 or more years. In low numbers initially, of course, and still increasing but yeah some of that Fred, data would i think correct me if i'm wrong john but some of the, our trapping reports uh that are posted on the internet um doesn't it show locations where those animals were uh registered or am i wrong about the counties it does show the counties and of course that would only be north of i-94 but yeah you could look correct. at yeah you could look at the the saint cloud area Forget the counties, even Todd and Morrison counties in that area. You can look at the trends through time in, in the harvest of mm -hmm. fishers. Um, and there is a report online with that. Right. Well, again, yeah, we don't have time to get to every single question here. Um, and we're just running out of time. So if you guys do have questions, you're more than welcome to reach out to Blaine or John or myself. If you missed their email addresses, shoot me an email. My email is on the website there and I will connect you with them. I wanna thank both of you for coming on today. It was a very interesting program. We got a lot of great comments in the comment section from the thanking, thanking the both of you for the information. I think overall, uh, it seems like fishers are a in, very interesting animal and their population's doing well. And it's kind of fun to get out and give you an excuse to get out in the woods and look for them a little bit and see if you can spot one, huh? Sounds good. I I was going to tell you what was coming up next, and I already forgot. Amber, I don't know if you're back there. You can jump in quick. Other than that, I want to thank everybody for coming today. Again, thanks to Blaine and John for joining us. And I think we can stop recording then and head to the back.